let me take a minute briefly just to thank our supervisors, Maria, Chantel, Peter, and OEC, uh, OSI for providing us with this opportunity. <coughs> it's in order for us to present the results of research we have been doing for the last five months. And the research I conducted uh, was on political representation of women in Kyrgyzstan with a specific focus on gender quotas and the impact they produce on political representation. But first of all, let me start with this picture of a former president of the Kyrgyz Republic, Rosa Otunbaeva, riding horses together with him. Well, this picture was very discussed, it was popular, uh, spotlighted everywhere, because the event itself, when she was sworn in in 2010, she said that a woman jumps on a horse and can fly ahead of any man, a woman is a fighter, a woman is a messenger, a woman is a polemicist. All of the things are real. Indeed, as I said, the event itself, her becoming a president, was quite revolutionary at that time, considering the fact that she became the first female head of st state in the history of at least uh, uh, post-Soviet Central Asia. And the number of women uh, in politics in Central Asia has gone down after the dissolution of uh, USSR. And um, underrepresentation of women in politics is a world tendency. While constituting 50% of world population, women are represented only by 22% in national parliament. And uh, Kyrgyzstan, unfortunately, was not an exclusion, and 2005 elections showed that how many zero women could be represented in the national parliament. Well, many countries with this kind of unprecedented case started start introducing different affirmative action tools. And uh, Kyrgyzstan did introduce gender quotas in 2007. It was a 30% candidate-based gender quota. And there was a big debate in terms of uh, should gender quotas be introduced in the first place or not. But it was introduced indeed as a fact, and uh, my role here was attempt to analyze the impact gender quota produced in the last two parliamentary convocations in 2007 and in 2010. So this is the research question I asked, and um, as I have said, there is a big debate in literature in regards to um, quality and quantity of uh, women elected. And if I start even with numbers, uh, gender quota in Kyrgyzstan serves as an immediate numerical example of an immediate uh, numerical effect. As you can see, in 2005, zero women, in 2007, 27%, and in 2010, 21%. As I have just mentioned, it's a 30% uh, quota, and as you can see from numbers, it was never filled in, neither in 2007 or in 2010. And the problem here was that immediately after elections, within one, three months, um, a certain number of women would resign. Uh, reasons for the resignations are very difficult to research, but the fact is still there, the quota is not filled in, and uh, the fact that uh, these women were replaced by men is uh, something alarming, and um, the lack of a replacement mechanism for resigning candidates with a candidate of the same sex, um, the problem is still here, and it has not been introduced uh, after two convocations, and it seems it's not going to be introduced in 2015 upcoming elections either. Now, when we are going to quality of women elected, I looked at two different uh, processes. The first one is what happens uh, even before women get into politics, into parliament, what kind of new developments or trends they face while going through recruitment. And uh, one of the first which uh, popped out uh, immediately was the number of women from civil society. So in 2007 there were four women, um, in 2010 the same number, and completely different eight women, considering the fact that before the introduction of gender quota, uh, civil society was not represented by females in the parliament. Uh, I think this is uh, something very uh, interesting and important. And now it can be the sign that uh, civil society seats can be translated into parliamentary seats, at least for women. The second uh, issue was uh, re-election. In 2010, four women were re-elected from 2007. And this is something very sensitive for female representation um, in Kyrgyzstan, because 
no woman was ever re-elected three times, whereas as many as 33 males were re-elected three times. And it has to do something with status, uh, with the uh, number of terms served, and with becoming a political actor. And as one of my um, respondents says, it can demonstrate some signs for institutionalization of women's presence in political parties, meaning that they're not randomly sought before elections, but considered to be fully fledged party members. However, there are still traditional barriers uh, for women to enter politics, and the first one is age. Age, a traditional barrier, not only for women, but for men as well. According to a Safe World report, uh, which was uh, conducted all over, it was a questionnaire which was conducted all over the country, the participation of women in politics was considered to be not something positive, but participation of young women in politics was considered to be almost culturally unacceptable. As you see on the uh, table, theory tells us that gender quotas would bring younger women into political arena. This is not true for Kyrgyzstan. The majority of elected women were between 50s and 60s. And uh, this gave the foundation for another quota implemented in the parliament, which is a youth, uh, minority, a youth quota for 15% um, of candidates. Another traditional barrier is ethnicity, and uh, it's again about the last quota I promise, which is for minority, ethnic minorities implemented in, in the parliament. And um, with numbers, it seems to be fine. 20% of women in 2007 and in 2010 were of a different ethnic origin. Well, but if we look at this ethnic origin, as you could see on the slide, uh, these women were only Russians. So just only one ethnic minority was represented in the uh, parliament, considering that the largest ethnic minority in the state uh, are Uzbeks, which constitute 40%. Females were never, Uzbek females were never represented uh, in the national parliament at all. There are different um, explanations for that, starting from the fact that uh, <coughs> women's rights, they're oppressed all over Central Asia, but there are some variations like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan are considered to be more conservative, but uh, there is also some institutional and political barriers for Uzbek to enter Kyrgyz, uh, to enter um, political arena in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, now going to the uh, second set of issues I looked at um, was what happens after women get into parliament, what kind of opportunities they have, how powerful they are. And I uh, look at different variables, and the first one is positional power of women, which has to do something with um, status of women, with, again, power they exercise, with number of terms served. And as you can see from the slide, positional power of women has definitely increased. And I had to change this slide just yesterday, uh, because, again, um, out of five vice um, speakers in the Kyrgyz parliament, four are women. And one of these women is from NGO. So two chair committees. And here, why I have to change it, because um, one of committees which uh, women got used to chair was a committee on social politics. It's no longer the case. And um, this is something, again, interesting. Um, now, where this takes us to the point of committee representation itself, committees were changed uh, in 2010 and in 2012, so it was a little bit difficult to analyze those. But to um, su summarize this, in 2007, the majority of elected women would prefer to go to committees um, traditionally associated with women's issues, like social politics, um, healthcare, youth, uh, regional politics, and in 2010 uh, there, is a, there will be a still number of women going for committees um, traditionally associated with women's issues, but there will be also women who would go to committees traditionally associated with um, male issues like energy, and vice chair of um, committee on energy as a woman, uh, also, economics and budget, uh, business, transport, communication. Um, here, very quickly, you see changes. New committees uh, were established, some were abolished, 
And the big clause here for um, women and for discussion of gender issues was the fact that um, Committee on Gender was transformed, it was a bigger committee on gender, youth, uh, sports, and it was transformed and it lost gender in its title. And as one of my interviews said, that was a big loss, and uh, now women lost this space or arena for uh, gender issues to be discussed in the parliament. Finally, I looked at um, legislative activity of female deputies, how active they are once they come into parliament. And you see these two slides for 2007 and for 2010. Um, you see that um, there are a lot of outliers. So one, uh, one um, woman would be very active initiating 25 different initiatives. Other two would not do anything during the whole term. And in 2010, the picture is a little bit better, but still, uh, in terms of legislative activity, women are very much diversified. And as I talk again to uh, people from civil society, from international organizations, those who work with these women, they're saying that in a lot of cases, women are lacking uh, education and legal training, and they would prefer to join big um, uh, initiatives, group initiatives, rather than go for individual ones. Um, when talking again to people working in Kyrgyzstan, working with Japanese, um, I found out two polar opinions on those. Uh, the first group of people would say that, well, women are just mere decorations, they do nothing, and they do not represent us at all. And the other opinion uh, was about the renaissance of gender equality, of gender issues, saying that the majority of laws favoring women, like one uh, against uh, bride on, uh, ban on bride kidnapping, gender violence, gender expertise was introduced, was specifically done by women who came through gender quotas into political arena. And I think both of these opinions are right, because women are so diversified in terms of um, legislative activity, as I could see, this is not really about critical mass, but about critical actors coming and initiating uh, specific laws favoring women and representing those. So, um, as to summarize very quickly, as you can see, gender quotas, which were introduced in 2007. They did introduce um, different uh, recruitment mechanisms. They brought some development, uh, recruitment developments. However, they were not able to overcome some of the traditional barriers, <coughs> and they brought women who are very much diversified in terms of their legislative activity. In this regards, I do provide recommendations, and for the government of the Kyrgyz Republic, the first is to improve the design of gender quota and to introduce the replacement mechanism for a resigning candidate, to return gender as a primary issue for one of the parliamentary committees, and to introduce this um, space for discussion of gender issues, for political parties to establish open and clear procedure for drafting the list of candidates to ensure that recruitment mechanisms are not disrupted, and for international organizations to provide training and legal education for women candidates and to focus on women electorates, specifically youth and ethnic minorities. I would like to finish my presentation with this picture of a feminist organization, SKU, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, which took a popular saying, uh, women, your place is in the house, and they added a White House of the Kyrgyzstan where parliamentaries <laughs> reside, and they said, well, woman, your place is in that house. Thank you very much. Thank you for my discussions, and I'm looking for your questions. I am a Southeast Asianist, not a Central Asianist, but I do work on gender, so my comments are going to be more broadly about how to um, work with women in Parliament and how to promote gender equality in Parliament. So gender quotas tend to be introduced into political systems at times of transition. So in Kyrgyzstan, after the Tulip Revolution. And they're often pushed by international organizations and domestic civil society. And they may be adopted by male political leaders who aren't really that convinced that gender equality or bringing women into parliament is important. But they're looking for some kind of international recognition and support, and therefore go along with such measures. Um, sometimes they're introduced cynically. 
so that male leaders can handpick malleable women uh, in their party who will then not be political rivals who are challenging them in the future. Um, the quota system in Kyrgyzstan has been effective in increasing the number of women in parliament, and partly that's because Kyrgyzstan already had a party list system, so it was easy to incorporate that quota into the party list system, um, with at least every third candidate on each party list having to be a woman. The goal of this type of gender quota is to create a floor of at least 30% of women in the parliament. But in fact, in many cases, this often ends up becoming a ceiling. That the party leaders feel that, okay, well now we've done our duty, we've got our 30%, so we don't need to go any further in recruiting more women. And I think we see that in Kyrgyzstan so far. I mean, even the quota itself hasn't been met. Um, in addition, as Natalia notes, elected female legislators who resign aren't replaced by women. This, again, indicates that the parties lack a genuine commitment to really empowering women in the legislature. The impact of having women in Parliament depends on several factors. As Natalia notes, one is achieving leadership positions in committees where legislative drafting takes place. But female legislators may lack the confidence or the knowledge to draft legislation. So one way to tackle this, as Natalia said in her recommendations, is to provide training for female legislators. But it can also be very helpful to establish a research unit that supports the parliament and can provide examples of similar laws in other countries and can also get data, collect data, on the issue that the parliamentarians are interested in drafting legislation about. Because if you don't have the data, it's very difficult to push the law through. And a lack of sex disaggregated data is one of the biggest problems for legislators who are trying to introduce gender sensitive legislation. Also, female legislators may need to receive party assistance in drafting and advocating for bills, which of course requires that the parties support these initiatives. To get the bills passed, women in parliaments in other countries have found that having a women's caucus, which brings women from different parties together, can sometimes help build confidence, support, and momentum. And I, I just learned that actually there is a caucus, um, but because of the diversity of female representatives coming from very different backgrounds and positions on women's issues. I think the caucus so far hasn't been that effective. Um, it's also important to cultivate male allies and where possible to obtain male co-sponsorship of legislation that women want to introduce. Ideally, sympathetic male parliamentarians would even chair gender committees, um, signaling that these issues are not just women's issues. Female lawmakers may also need to galvanize support for their measures outside of Parliament by going to civil society and really working with civil society to galvanize public opinion and put pressure on the parties to support this legislation. The media is also another important source for female parliamentarians to use to really reach the public and get the public to put pressure on their parliamentarians. Nevertheless, it must be recognized that just having women in Parliament doesn't mean that they're all going to vote for feminist agendas. In fact, there's going to be a diversity of female representation, and some may even introduce uh, very conservative or restrictive bills, as we've seen in Kyrgyzstan. For instance, there was a resolution that was introduced by a woman and passed that said that young women should not be allowed to leave Kyrgyzstan um, unless they have their parents' permission. So one has to accept that women are not a single category, but have different interests and beliefs. Natalia notes that most female legislators in Kyrgyzstan are older, and she gave some cultural reasons for why that might be the case in Kyrgyzstan. But in many countries, it's difficult for women with young children, so younger women who are in their parenting years, to enter parliament because the parliamentary norms are such that um, you have to stay late, you have to work on the weekends, the schedule is unpredictable, there's no child care at the parliament, and it makes it very difficult for younger women with children to participate. So addressing, and in addition, the cultural norms that it's the mother's responsibility to take care of the children. Um, so addressing the operational norms of the parliament is also important in terms of providing an environment that's conducive to bringing younger women into the parliament. And Natalia pointed out in her paper, although she didn't talk about it today, that many of the women in the 2010 parliament are businesswomen. 
And in fact, throughout the world, a lack of financial resources um, is a common barrier to entry for women. So women tend to be poorer than men. They tend to have fewer connections who could support them in their campaigns. And um, so there are various ways to enable women of different backgrounds to run for parliament. Internal political party funds can be established to support them. Um, there can be limits set on all candidates' expenditures for, uh, and, and that can include nomination fees too, how much um, they have to pay to register and their campaign expenditures. And public funding can be provided to all candidates who are running in the election, for instance, by setting, um, you know, a, a saying that they have to get a certain number of signatures in order to get that public finance. Once in Parliament, female legislators should think of their roles as going beyond introducing specific bills on gender-related issues. They can scrutinize all legislation that is introduced from a gender perspective. They can analyze the government's budget from a gender perspective and recommend changes. They can establish temporary commissions to investigate and issue recommendations on gender-related issues. And they can use their positions to advocate to the public uh, about gender issues through public outreach and holding events on days like International Women's Day. Uh, the next thing I wanted to, to pose, the next question I wanted to pose is, are quotas a good idea? Quotas can lead male parliamentarians and the public to think that female parliamentarians should only discuss issues that relate to women, even though male representatives are not looked at in the same light as only being responsible for male issues. And it is a question, what do people mean by women's issues, because aren't these issues really everybody's issues? Some legislators may feel, some female legislators may feel belittled because they're seen as quota women. Um, but others, as Natalia pointed out, feel that their position in Parliament is important and they may gain confidence over time and in many cases do become respected by male colleagues and the public. Another important finding is that having quotas encourages females among the broader public to get more engaged in politics. So women are more likely to talk to female legislators than they are to male legislators. And seeing those role models in politics is inspirational for young people to uh, consider running themselves. Nevertheless, context is important, and quotas can work differently depending on a country's political culture, the degree to which the women's movement or civil society more generally is supporting female parliamentarians, and to what extent female parliamentarians can develop an, uh, the necessary skills and win over sufficient male colleagues to really make an impact. Thank you. So I'm Gina Shirillo. I work on the Gender, Women, and Democracy program at the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your work. And I was, I was saying that it's really great to see other people with a passion for what we do because it can seem kind of like an uphill battle when you want to talk about gender issues and gender equality and women's political participation. Um, so first, I want to give you a little bit of background about what the National Democratic Institute does, specifically in promoting women's political participation in Kyrgyzstan, um, and our work uh, promote, empowering civil society organizations to work on gender quotas around the world, um, and then give more specific <coughs> comments on your paper. Um, so the National Democratic Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works to strengthen democratic governance around the world. So we have programs in over 65 countries looking at issues from elections, political parties, citizen participation, women's political participation, and um, technology and governance issues. Um, specifically, what we work to do on the Gender, Women, and Democracy team is empower women to participate, compete, and lead as equal and active partners in democratic change. So this just doesn't mean necessarily getting women at the table and getting the numbers higher, as you know we've seen here, just getting women in parliament, but getting them to participate in a meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Um, so specifically in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the National Democratic Institute's been working there since 1996. Um, we've been working with political parties in parliament, mostly. Um, and specifically on women's political participation in 2010, um, excuse me, in 2011, we worked um, with the Women in Parliament to, f to form an informal women's caucus. Um, and 
um, to get them to come together on monthly meetings to talk about issues that are legislative priorities for them. And I think both of you hit the nail on the head in the fact that women um, are not a homogenous group, even though people assume that women will get to the table and have all the same priorities. There are a lot of different pressures um, and external factors that lead women to set different priorities. So I think a challenge when you're forming an informal women's caucus to come together on legislative issues is that you have to remember that these women are also representing their communities, they might be representing minority groups, they might be young women, um, and they might be facing external pressures from their political parties in order to push forward forward certain types of legislation. Um, NTI also has been supporting the Women's Discussion Club since 2006. Um, it's a nonprofit organization in Kyrgyzstan that has been working to get more women active in politics. Um, and specifically, we've worked with them to connect female MPs to um, women who are elected at the local level. Um, because we understand while it's very important for women to be represented at the national level, women in the local level is also very critical. And so we want wanted to kind of match up the priorities of women MPs with women from local communities. Um, and that can be challenging because, you know, of varying schedules and like I mentioned before, external pressures. But um, we see that if women MPs are more connected with local issues in their communities, they might be able to be more responsive to citizen concerns. Um, and through the Women's Discussion Club as well, we um, worked with them to form a coalition of women's wings from political parties. So some political parties have specific organizations within their internal structures that um, are responsive to women's concerns and are tasks, tasked with re reaching out to women voters. Um, and so we wanted to help them form a multi-party organization in order to um, train women political party activists so that they could go back into their own political parties um, and train more women on capacity building, techniques and skills, on negotiating within their own parties so that they do get a seat at the table, um, and to really empower each other across parties um, to really demand a more active role within their own parties. Um, so that's a little bit about what NDI has done and is doing currently in, with our women's political participation programming in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I think more broadly uh, related to quotas, uh, the National Democratic Institute has done a lot to support women's CSO groups around the world um, if they choose to advocate for a gender quota in their own community. So the National Democratic Institute is of the idea that you know gender quotas are one way that we can really increase women's political participation, and we see that you know nominally nominally it works. It gets more women at the table, um, but it's important to talk about what to do once women are at the table. Like, so what? Women are in parliament, what do we do now? And I think Professor Fink covered this very, very well and talked about, you know, all the ways that we can empower those women who are there um, to really be, you know, have an equal standing to men. And I wanted to include a little bit more from our programming and our experience on what additionally parliaments and political parties can do and talk specifically about your recommendations from Talia. So, um, Implementation of quotas are also key, um, and I think that one way that political parties can show that they support women party activists is that they can incorporate um, into their bylaws and into their internal constitutions um, different clauses that talk about the importance of gender equality so that women political party activists and women candidates will really feel actually supported by their parties and not just that parties are putting them on the list because they have to, but that they're actually being supported by political parties when political parties go further than required by law to include women. Um, this includes making a more transparent candidate nomination and recruitment process, putting women in winnable positions on party lists, um, working with CSO groups who can advocate for the implementation of gender quotas and really pressure um, those political parties to meet the gender quotas. Um, forming alliances with male political party leaders and leaders in the government to ensure that the quota law is actually implemented and to ensure that the women who are going to be part of the quota have the skills and confidence in order to be candidates on that list. Um, so, you know, once women are in parliament, it's important that individually they feel that they have the skills they need, that the institutions, so the parliaments themselves, 
are responding to the fact that, you know, in Kyrgyzstan there were no women in parliament and now there are. What does that mean differently for the institution itself? And finally, that those socio-cultural barriers are addressed. Um, so first, it's important to remember that, you know, as Natalia pointed out, a lot of these women come from business, they come from CSOs, so they might not have as much experience in politics as these men who are getting re-elected for multiple terms. Um, and so it's important to note that because of that, they might not know the parliamentary rules that exist. They might not know how to draft legislation. And it's important that you know parties don't just put them there, but that they equip them with the skills they need. And I think this is something that the National Democratic Institute does around the world. We work with newly elected female parliamentarians in order to train them on the skills they need, recognizing that they probably don't have the wealth of experience that a lot of the male parliamentarians have. Um, in addition, it's important to look at parliamentary institutions and how the parliament themselves run, itself runs. Um, so things like, are there bathrooms for women parliamentarians? Is there a women's restroom in parliament? It seems like a really small thing and something that we kind of take for granted here in the United States, but a lot of parliaments around the world who got women legislators didn't have a women's restroom. And the woman would have to leave and go across the street and miss part of session so that she could use the restroom. And that obviously is a factor in how effective that woman can be in parliament is she's missing votes to use the restroom. Um, in addition, you know, thinking about things like daycare, um, as Professor Fink pointed out, you know, women are often seen socially and culturally as the people who are there for the children. Um, but if you have parliaments that don't have daycare or don't have flexible hours for women parliamentarians so that they can put on, you know, the different, you know, the female parliamentarian hat and the mother hat, then you have women parliamentarians that aren't as equipped to to be participating fully in parliament. Um, and finally, you just have kind of the cultural and socio um, societal barriers that exist. Um, if you think about, is the speaker a male? Does the speaker call on only male parliamentarians? When a woman parliamentarian is speaking in parliament, do men listen? Do they take notes? Do they leave the room? You know, just that inherent sexism that exists among the male parliamentarians, the legislative staff, you know, in, in situations like that can be a real challenge. Um, so when, when we're looking and evaluating how effective women are as legislators and if they're, you know, truly living up to what, I guess, the gender quota has intended them to do, we have to take all those external factors into account because it's unfair to hold women to, first of all, a higher standard than men and that they must represent all women. You know, we're not asking men to, you know, represent all men, but women come in with the extra, you know, task of, hey, you're women, you're here, now you need to represent all women on all women's issues in parliament. And, and I think with that and all the other institutional factors that exist, we need to be careful when we're saying, you know, oh, these women aren't as effective because they're not representing all women. We really need to take all those factors into account and try to mitigate those barriers, which is what we try to do at the National Democratic Institute. Um, so my comments on your paper specifically are going to focus on your recommendations, all of which I think are really important, um, and just add a little bit to, to what you had said. So in terms of having a replacement clause within the gender quota legislation, I think is critical. Men and male party leaders often can find very, very creative ways to keep women out of government. And it's like kind of impressive, actually, to see like what the lengths they'll go to to try to you know, keep women out of, out of government, and this is one way, is they have women resign and they have men replace them. And, you know, they're tricky. They, they found a loophole, but, uh, you know, now it's, it's our job to close the loophole. So adding a clause about how um, if a, a woman parliamentarian resigns, that she must be replaced by a member of her same sex, I think is important, especially if you haven't reached that 30% <laughs> threshold yet. Um, I think in addition, something that could be important and could be incorporated into actually the youth quota and the minority quota is that, you know, you mentioned there aren't young women represented in parliament and there's only one ethnic minority represented among women. Um, and one thing that they could do is within the youth and minority quotas, specify that half of those coming in for that quota have to be women. 
So not just making the quota for young people, but making it for young men and young women, and not just making it for ethnic minorities, but making it for ethnic minorities who are women and men, to kind of specify that half of the youth that come out of this quota have to be women would help increase women's overall representation in parliament, but also increase the representation by young women. So a lot of times when people say youth or minorities, the default in everyone's head is young men. Um, and or you know minority men and I think that you have to say women for people to think of women um, so those would be um, sort of my recommendations along the quota law itself in terms of the government and how you know the committee that used to have gender politics in the name no longer has gender politics in the name um, yeah that's really discouraging it's it's sad to see that that's not a priority for the parliament at least in name but I think a positive opportunity that can come out of this is, you know, as you mentioned, women are more broadly placed on committees. So it's a more wide swath of women. And something that Professor Fink also said was that, you know, these women can uh, work on gender sensitive, sensitive legislation in those committees. So it's not that we need to silo women and put them in a committee by themselves that work on women issues and you're just like, oh, those are the women over there doing their lady things. You know, you, you want to have women parliamentarians who are represented in these diverse committees helping to introduce gender sensitive legislation on energy, on economic policies, on city planning. And so having women in a more widespread variety of committees is actually a strength as long as those women have the capacity and skills and understand the importance of introducing gender sensitive legislation. Um, and finally, um, I want to say that I think that you're totally correct on the fact that the candidate recruitment process needs to be more transparent. Um, when a couple leaders at the top choose party lists, it's hard for women to compete and know what they need to do to compete well. I would also say that political parties could have specific trainings for women activists and a lot part of their budget to women's political participation. A lot of times, as Professor Fink pointed out, these initiatives won't go through unless they're noted in the budgets. So financing is often a huge barrier for women in politics. Um, and if you can get political parties or governments in their public financing legislation to allot specific amounts for women's political participation, we've seen this in Mexico, um, who has a 2% rule for public financing to political parties to go to women's political participation. This is something that can help prepare those women to go there. <laughs> Um, so thank you again for inviting me to come here and share NDI's work and, and, and your wonderful work on your paper and, and furthering women's political participation in Kansas. Thank you.